right, so this is uh, called This is the Covenant. I want to continue on something that I'd started uh, two weeks ago. Uh, every, every couple of years, it feels like I just have to spend some time on covenant because it's super foundational, super important to all kind of be on the same page with this. Uh, and it's so foundational for our walk with God. Uh, so it started two weeks ago, and then uh, last week Todd gave his message. You guys enjoy that? <laughs> yeah, I was super proud of him. Excellent. So let's, uh, let's continue on with covenant. I want to uh, review really briefly, though, just from last uh, last two weeks ago, where we started, so we kind of set the table again. And if you missed that message, I'll at least bring you back onto the onto the same page with us here. Uh, so Hebrews 13, is it? Yes, verse 20 and 21 uh, says, I believe it's Paul. He didn't sign this letter, but I believe it's him. And he said, May the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. So uh, this verse clearly, he's talking about uh, the fact that he's going to make us, what does he say, complete in every good work to do his will. He's transforming us on the inside, right, which we know was basically impossible under the old covenant. There was no inner transformation, really, that happened for people. There was a set of laws and rules, right, that were given to Israel. Uh, but in the new covenant, God gets to transform and change our hearts, change us from the inside. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, yeah, and verse 20 mentions, though, that he's doing this through something called the everlasting covenant, right? And it's, uh, he uses the phrase, the, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. And so we know that... Uh, God is a covenant God, right? And he started that back in Genesis. He made a covenant with uh, Noah, right, and the, and the rest of the earth that he would never again flood the earth. Uh, he also made a covenant with a guy named Abraham, right? And that's how we ended up with the, the um, Jewish people, the people of Israel, uh, and many other people besides. He made a covenant with uh, David at one point. Well, he, before that, he made a covenant with the nation of Israel through the prophet Moses, right? Uh, God made a covenant with uh, David, actually, that he would have a, King David would have a descendant on the throne forever. Turns out to be Jesus, of course. And so uh, we know that God, throughout history, God was making covenants, and he was always leading up to the one big final and forever covenant, right? Which here is called the everlasting covenant. That's the one everything was leading to. That's the one that we're in now. Uh, it's an amazing thing. Uh, why does God make covenant, right? Again, we, in our culture, we don't tend to understand covenant real well. We understand contracts, right? We drop a contract, you sign here, I sign there, and, you know, there's some specific terms, but that's nothing close to covenant. Covenant is, I mean, the, the best way we understand covenant today still is marriage, right? Marriage is the, is the thing that is um, a, a remainder of, of covenant, the idea of covenant. And so in covenant, everything that's mine is yours, everything is yours is mine, our lives are joined together, pledged together, right, in every way. Uh, if you're attacked, I defend you. If I'm attacked, you defend me. If you need something and I have it, I help you, vice versa. Right, covenant is all in, right? And so God is a God of covenant, and he makes covenant with us. And again, I believe that the reason he does that is for our benefit, right? So that we can, if we understand covenant, we can find security in our relationship with God, right? Because I believe that people thrive best, grow best when they're in secure and committed relationships, and loving relationships, right? But secure and committed relationships. So if, you know, if you're in a relationship and you don't know day to day, are you going to be here tomorrow? I don't know. No promises, <laughs> right? You know, um, is either of us going to be here tomorrow? I don't know. No promises. You know, it's, we're not designed for those kind of relationships, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work very well. But when the important relationships in our life, we want security, we want commitment, and we want love, right? And God says, I know you need that, and I'm going to provide that. I'm a covenant God, right? And he keeps his word, but the covenant helps us to trust. It helps us to know and understand and believe. So he makes these, he makes these uh, covenants. We talked briefly, too, last week about what, what goes into the making of a covenant. And I'll just uh, real quickly throw those out again. Covenants are typically made with a blood ritual, a blood ceremony of some kind. Very important. Often an animal sacrifice. Sometimes our own blood mixed together. There's various ways of doing that. But co covenants were made by by some kind of blood uh, ritual or ceremony, speaking of the seriousness uh, and other things as well. Uh, covenants were uh, also involve promises and vows. I promise you that I will do this. I vow to you that I will do this. Bilateral covenants are when both parties make vows to each other, make promises to each other. Unilateral covenants or promises are when one person only makes all the promises and the other person doesn't make any promises, right? Uh, but promises made are, are meant to be kept. Uh, let's see, 
what else did we have here? Uh, there's a sign. Covenants typically involve a sign. So when God made the covenant with Noah not to flood the earth anymore, the sign was the rainbow right, in the sky. When he made a covenant with Abraham and his descendants, the sign was circumcision of the men. When he made a covenant with the nation of Israel, the sign of the covenant was the Sabbath day, keeping the Sabbath day, uh, which we call Saturday. Uh, when, let's see, God made a covenant with us through Christ, right, the sign of that covenant is water baptism, right? And so on and on. And in, uh, in marriage, the sign would be the wedding ring. Uh, there's an exchange of names that often happens, that happens in marriage generally and uh, often in covenant. There's often witnesses involved. Uh, there's a defined time limit. Covenants are generally until death do us part, right? Uh, in, this, in the case of this particular covenant, actually, is it still up there? Hebrews 13, 20. Yeah, the, the specific time limit for this covenant is, is mentioned. There it is. How long does this covenant last? Yeah, forever and ever. Yeah, that's good. So uh, God lives forever, and in covenant, we have what God has. We have everlasting life with him. So that's good to know. There's also uh, covenants are often made with a shared meal of some kind. It happens at weddings. Uh, we, in our case, uh, the shared meal is uh, communion, right? The Lord's Supper that we take, yeah, uh, fairly often. Uh, so those, that's how covenants are generally made. Um, very, very serious stuff. God, again, does this for our benefit. And so uh, in, uh, the, in the Old Testament, what we looked at really briefly was, you know, God made covenant with Israel through Moses, and that was a bilateral covenant, right? That was God says, I promise you to bless you and give you victory and all these amazing things if you follow my commandments and follow my, you know, statutes and my rules and all that. And Israel also made a promise on their end. It's a bilateral covenant, two-sided, and all the people of Israel promised, and they said what? <laughs> we will obey. We will follow your commandments. We will, right? And they promised, and this happened at Mount Sinai, and they sacrificed animals, and they sprinkled the blood all over the people, making the old covenant, right? And the people were bound by their promise, we will obey. And that covenant did not work. That covenant was broken the day it was made, right? It, was, it did not last that long. And the next 1,500 years, right, God was trying to enforce this covenant with Israel and trying to get them to be faithful to this covenant, and they never could and they never did. And we wouldn't have either, right, because human, humanity infected by sin is incapable of keeping that covenant with God. And so for 1,500 years, it was tried and broken. And then Jesus came 2,000 years ago now, and he's going to bring the new covenant, right? And so in uh, Luke uh, 22... Again, real, just quickly here. Right before the cross at the Passover supper, it says, when the hour had come, Jesus sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Here's our celebratory meal, covenant, right? Covenant meal that we take regularly. And then, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is, what? <laughs> the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. So, Jesus is actually announcing the new covenant, which had been prophesied, and we're going to read that prophecy here in a moment. It's in Jeremiah. Uh, the new covenant had been prophesied in many places, actually. And, uh, and Jesus said, it's happening right now. It's happening right now. The old covenant's going to come to an end. The new covenant's going to be instituted. It's going to be, it's going to be uh, instituted with my own blood, not with the blood of an animal sacrifice, but it's going to be sealed right, and made covenant with my blood, and it's going to be forever and ever. This is what we've all been leading up to. Did the apostles understand this at the time? Not really, no. <laughs> you know, I think they were probably familiar with, with promises of a new covenant, but they're going, what, now? Now? What? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and... Uh, so, but one of the things I emphasized and, uh, two weeks ago, and I have, to, I have to put this out there again before we move on uh, and build on this, is so important to understand this. 
the old covenant, right, was between God and Israel, and it failed because of that, because Israel couldn't keep their part, and neither would we, right? The new covenant, people commonly misunderstand this and think that as Christians, our covenant is between God and us. And really, really, it's not. We're in the covenant, but really the covenant is between God the Father and God the Son. Amen? <laughs> it's between God the Father and Jesus Christ, the man Jesus Christ, who is also God incarnate. And the reason why this covenant works is because which one of those is ever going to mess it up? <laughs> no, this covenant stands because, yeah, we're not Israel. We're not, we're not in covenant with God where it depends on our, our, you know, performance. This is between God the Father, God the Son. Perfect. Nobody messes it up. The covenant stands forever and ever and ever and ever. It depends on Jesus. Amen. That's really, really good. We get to be in the covenant or out of the covenant, but the covenant, we didn't make the covenant, and the covenant doesn't depend on us. It doesn't stand on us in any way. We get to be in or out. We're in by faith. We're out by unbelief, right, or by rejection. But we're, we're in by accepting Jesus, by saying yes to Jesus and trusting in him. That's our choice, in or out. That's really good news, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Uh, so if we didn't make the covenant, we get to be in the covenant when we come under Jesus, who is the head, right, of this side of the covenant. When we're in Christ, boom, we're in the covenant. And all the conditions, all the promises are ours. Amen? All the inheritance is ours. This is really, really good news. So <laughs> let's, uh, yeah, every time we take communion, really what we're doing is we're celebrating the covenant. You know, uh, there's other things, but that's one of the big things we're doing is we're reaffirming that covenant. So let's go on to, uh, let's build on this. Jeremiah 31, 31 is the prophecy that actually predicted the new covenant. And this is really, really cool. So Jeremiah uh, gives this prophecy from the Lord, I don't know, six or 700 years, you know, before, before Jesus comes. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't get the exact time, but yeah, in that general neighborhood. So he prophesies this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a, what, <laughs> new covenant, yeah, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, and it's implied with any of us that want to be part of it, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they, what, <laughs> broke, yeah, can a covenant be broken? Plainly it can, and it's plainly God says that they did, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Amen. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. All right. So let's go back to 31 and kind of understand it more, dive in a little bit deeper. So again, six or seven hundred years before uh, this happens, there's a prophecy. Behold, the days are coming, says God. Yeah, it'll be about six or seven hundred years in the future, but hold on, it's coming. <laughs> That's good. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And now he's, he's speaking in the midst of, really in about the, almost the middle time of this covenant, from the time it was made to the time it, it you know, ends. When, on the cross when Jesus says it is finished, right? This is kind of in the middle of time, and God's saying, yeah, this covenant, it's not going to work. <laughs> I already know it's not going to work. We're going to do a new thing. We're going to make a new one. But he knew that already, didn't he? He was planning for this, preparing for this. All the covenants lead up to the final, the final and forever everlasting covenant. So he says, yeah, it's going to happen. I'm going to make a new covenant. Go ahead. And we're all invited into it. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. Hmm. Okay, well, that's important to understand. Uh, why, why does he say not according to? It's going to be completely different. This covenant is different in nature. Why? Well, if the first covenant didn't work, do you want to just repeat it the same way? Uh, right? If it doesn't work, let's change it, right? right? So we're going to do something completely different. Complete, and this is a, this is a major, um, I think, uh, Lack of understanding in a whole lot of believers, a whole lot of people that, you know, believe in Jesus, but it's a major lack of understanding here because we sort of have the idea that it, the covenant's really the same. You know, God has his rules and his laws, and we follow them, and it depends on us, and Jesus is in there somewhere, right? <laughs> you know, and, and that's, that's a major misunderstanding here. 
the covenant is not like the old covenant. God said so. I'm not going to do it the same way. Because if the covenant was between God and us, we'd still mess it up, wouldn't we? It would still fail. Okay, so it says it's not going to be that way with their, the covenant that I made with their fathers. And the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, stopped at Mount Sinai and made that covenant, my covenant which they broke. Yeah, <laughs> didn't... Uh, you know the story, Moses spent time on the mountain with God, and God gave him the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone, right? And as Moses descended from the mountain, the people were already sinning and getting into idolatry. And <laughs> I mean, that, co that covenant was broken as soon as it was made. He came down with those tablets of stone. He saw what was happening. He was so mad, he threw them down and broke them, smashed them, the tablets of stone, which symbolically means the covenant's already broken. Hot off the press, and it's broken already. Boom. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> yeah, and, you know, he remakes them, he remakes the tablets and everything, you know, and they, they go on. But essentially, God said, yeah, they broke that covenant over and over and over and over and over, right? And, and, and he, knew, he knew they would, he knew we would, and it was an illustrated sermon. It was a way of saying, right, people of earth, <laughs> do you think you need a Savior, <laughs> right? Or can you handle this yourself, right? Oh, we can do it, we can do it. All right, let me know when you think you need a Savior, right? <laughs> Though I was a husband to them. This is interesting because in, in the Old Testament, God says to Israel uh, two things. One, he says, I'm a husband to you. And he also said, I'm a father to you. Which means that God was always kind of trying to do these two things. Be a father to them and then be a husband as a, as a bride to, you know, this people. Uh, and it turns out, really, it only works in the New Covenant, right? When we get born again and we're, God is actually our father, right? And we're his sons and daughters. And where Jesus becomes the bridegroom and the church becomes the bride. And this is where it actually works. But God's always been leading toward that and trying to do that. So, go ahead. But this is the covenant that I will make. This is really cool. So, uh, the simple meaning of this is God said, Listen up, everybody. This is the covenant. In the next 30 seconds, I'm going to tell you what the covenant is, and you'll understand it. Boom. How's that? <laughs> That's good news, isn't it? We tend to think, well, this covenant, it's probably a great big policy book, you know, with 6,000 pages. It's a foot tall, and you have to, you know, open here and find section 14, subsection A, you know, you know, you know find out what the covenant is. No, he says, I'm going to tell you in the next 30 seconds what the covenant is. You'll get it. We'll be fine. Right? <laughs> I love that. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. And anybody else that wants in, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. Stay, stay there for a second. So what's he saying? I'll put my law on your heart and on your mind. He's actually, he's actually um, prophesying about the new birth, what we call the new birth. When Jesus came, he said, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit, right? And so what he's saying is, under the old covenant, hearts were not changed. But in the new covenant, you're going to be born again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a new spirit, literally born from heaven, born from the Spirit of God. You're going to have the nature of God on the inside of you, right? Not the nature of a sinner, not the nature of a, rebe of a rebel. You're going to have the nature of a son or a daughter, uh, a, a, with the nature of God transforming you from the inside out. Whew, good news, huh? Right? Our mind's still kind of in conflict with this, but he says, I'm going to write my laws on your mind also. Right? I'm going to teach you, and the Spirit of God is going to come and live on the inside of you right? and illuminate my word to you and transform you from the inside out. Right? There's a process to this thing, but he said that's, that's the difference. Old covenant written on tablets of stone. Right? New covenant written on your heart. His nature is written on your heart. Amen? Oh, that's good. What a, what a great contrast. Tablets of stone versus your heart. All right. So then he says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is awesome. He's saying under the old covenant, Israel couldn't keep their end. And, you know, they would say, you are our God, Lord, you are our God. And then, you know, a week later, they'd be worshiping Baal and they'd be worshiping Molech and they'd be worshiping Ashtaroth and, you know, have their idols and their statues again and whatever. Right. And God said, no, we're not going to do that. I'm going to be your God. Right? <laughs> and you're going to you're going to be my people. It's going to be faithful. It's going to be committed. It's going to be secure. It's going to be solid. Right. And I get to bless you. I don't have to like into the old covenant. God had to continually judge them and punish them because that was the terms of the covenant, right? And they agreed to it. Right? And so in the new covenant, he says, yeah, we're not going to do that. I'm going to deal with you as sons and daughters, 
right? It, does he still correct us? Oh, yeah, sure. Does he, does he, you know, change us? Yeah, absolutely he does. But it's not the old covenant of judgment and, you know, punishment because that was built into the old covenant. They agreed to it. We will obey. If we don't obey, there's curses and judgments, right? God said, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. In fact, you're going to be sons and daughters, right? Yeah, yeah. And this is going to be a good relationship, and it's going to go on and on and on forever. Whew. That satisfies God's heart. Go ahead. But no, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. Okay, what's that? Under the old covenant, most people really didn't even know God, did they? They had you know, tablets of stone that says thou shalt and thou shalt not, right? And they, they had a temple and the priests and there was, you know, they had some things they could do, but it was all external. They didn't really know God, right? The average person really did not. Um, under the old covenant, only a few people really knew God and they were called the priests, the prophets, and the kings, right? And so if someone was called as a prophet like Jeremiah, the spirit of God would come upon him, right? and interact with him and speak to him, and he would prophesy. So it, Jeremiah kind of knew God, didn't he? But you know what Jeremiah did not have? He didn't have what you have. He wasn't born again. He did not have a new spirit on, inside of him. He did not have the spirit of God living inside of him permanently. What he had is the spirit of God would come upon him and give him messages, and that was his experience. But he didn't have what you have, the spirit of God living inside of you. Wow. Right? And, the, and the priests also and the kings, the, the Spirit of God would come upon them and anoint them for their office or their role right, to, to Israel. And so they would have some experience with God. But the average person had none. Right? Only the greats, kings, priests, and prophets had this at all. And God said, yeah, we're going to change that whole system completely. Here's the new covenant. Everybody gets to know me. Right? Everybody, the greatest to the least. If you're the greatest world-traveling apostle or if you're a person who lives in Apache Junction and you live your life and you love Jesus, right? and you're just being a light to those around you, so God says, you get to know me personally. I'll live on the inside of you. We'll lead you and talk with you and interact with you. If you want this, if you lean into this, you'll experience this. Right? This is your privilege in the new covenant. You get to know me. Wow. And how does that work? The last thing he says, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will rem remember no more. That's how this is possible, right, God? Because sin separated us. God said, we gotta, we got to deal with this. So Jesus on the cross, right, took our sin, took our guilt. We know this, right? He paid for it with his blood, with his life. Riz, rose from the dead when it was finished, and he said, all right, it's done. It's paid for. Justice is satisfied. Your iniquity is forgiven. Your sin is forgiven. There's no separation now, right, if you believe. But here's, here's the cool thing. He said, what is it? Your sin I will remember no more. That's an interesting statement. That challenges my thinking a little bit because how can an omniscient God, all-knowing God, purposely forget something and actually forget it? <laughs> right? How can he do that? You know? And uh, does that challenge anybody else's thinking? Well, yeah, like, God, I know, I, I thank you that I'm forgiven, but did you really forget? <laughs> you know, <laughs> did you really, you know, you pick up some clues by my conversation, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So here's the deal, as I see it. I don't have to understand how God does this, but my choice is do I believe him or not? And I say yes. God, if you said you're going to forget it and not remember it, I'm like, okay, I'm in. Good. That's good. Right? <laughs> that means guilt is gone, shame is gone, limitation is gone, judgment is gone, condemnation is gone. Like you really, right? Well, how about things that are a little more recent? Well, when you say, God, forgive me, wash me in your blood, yeah, it's gone. It's gone, right? You know, it's really interesting. I mean, he already paid for our sins before we were born, right? We're already forgiven. Oh, shh. It'll melt your brain. But the moment you say yes to Jesus, it's all yours. Okay? It's all yours. Your sin I will remember no more. Well, if he can forget it, maybe I can forget it too. All right. And then we can live. Right? We can live for Jesus without limitation, without shame, without condemnation. We can live and go as far as we can go. Right? This is really good. So he says, this is the covenant. Yeah. That's it. There's not a big book with subsection, you know, 16 and, or, you know, what I'm saying. This is it. So something else I want you to notice 
here uh, is, go back to 33 if you would for a second. This covenant is, is kind of unilateral in one sense. Who makes all the promises here? God, right? What promises do we make? Really, I mean, seriously, what promises do we make coming into this thing? I promise I will always do everything right. I promise I will follow every rule and never fail. Do we do, we do that? Oh, thank God we don't because, yeah, well, that wouldn't have worked. But it, yeah, the promi- the, yeah, the real covenant is between God the Father, God the Son, and we're invited into it. God makes all the promises here. Notice, notice um, that God says these two words, I will. And let's see how many times he says it, right? It's really interesting. This is the covenant that... I will make with the house of Israel. That's one. After these days, says the Lord, I will, two, put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will, three, be their God and they shall be my people. Keep going. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin... I will remember no more. Ha, huh, that's pretty interesting. How many times? Five times, right? Anybody know anything about um, number symbolism in the Bible? Yeah, grace, right? Yeah, different numbers have symbols. Three for the Trinity, and, you know, seven is spiritual perfection and completion, and, you know, 12 is government, and all these numbers have, have some meaning, and when they show up in the Bible, five is the number of grace. And God says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Here's the covenant. Who's in? <laughs> my part is to be in or out. That's my choice, right? Yeah, that's it. I will, I will. We don't say I will. We don't say, you know, I do. We don't say any of these things. Again, it's, it's clearly implied by one of those I wills that he's going to change our hearts, isn't he? He's going to work in us if we say yes, right? And we cooperate with this. Of course we do. We learn to cooperate and go with this change. But he says, I will. It's my work. Uh, amazing stuff. Um, Colossians 1, 9 to 12. Uh, and I'm, I'm reading this. It's a, one of prayers, Paul, uh, Paul's prayers for the Colossians and for us. Um, but I'm, I'm really headed for verse 12, so I just want to read the context. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Go ahead. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. Oh, that's interesting. Walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. Is that something God wants in this covenant? Absolutely it is. Yeah. Uh, Is that something that we do in order to get His acceptance, in order to get His approval? Is this something we do because He's already brought us into covenant? There you go. He's already brought us into covenant. He's given us forgiveness. He's, and he said, now I want, I want you to learn to walk worthy of this calling, worthy of what you already have, right? worthy of who you already are now. Let's learn to walk worthy. Right? Are we going to do it perfectly from the start? No, but it's over our lifetime, we learn to do this. And we, we can and should correct ourselves when we mess up, right? And we can and, sh- and should ask for forgiveness when we mess up. But essentially, we already have this covenant, and we're learning to walk it out and learning to be pleasing to him because our heart has changed. Amen? Go ahead. And strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Holy Spirit inside of us strengthening us. Go ahead. Giving thanks to the Father. I read all this to get to this point. We give thanks to the Father who has what? qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Well, this is pretty good news, too. Um, because, the t- the, again, religious understanding is I qualify myself by following the rules, right? Rule 17, subsection C, you know, <laughs> whatever. We got to know. We got to get it all right. right? We gotta, and, and Christians often get hung up on stuff. Well, you know, God can't bless me because there's some little thing that I've messed up, some little thing I, I did wrong, some little thing. I may not even know what it is, you know. I don't, I'm, I'm trying to qualify myself, but I don't even know for sure how to know if I'm qualified, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about there, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. And so, and religion will help you with that. Try and make it even more complicated, you know. And God says, no, I got this covered, right? Give thanks to the Father because he has already qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. And the life. And he's talking about covenant there. 
talking about you being on the receiving end of this covenant, you're qualified to be an heir of God, right? Because the, the covenant is between God the Father, God the Son, and Jesus himself famously said, everything the Father has is mine, right? He's talking covenant, right? It's covenant talk. Well, he's also God, I get it, right? But he's talking covenant talk as a man. And then it says in Romans 8 that we become joint heirs with Christ, right? Co-heirs with Christ. How did I get that? Covenant. You're in Christ, right? Joint heir with him. How did I qualify to be a partaker of that inheritance? You said yes to Jesus. You were invited into a covenant, and it's all yours. And God qualified you. He washed away your sin. He forgets your sin, right? He gives you a new heart on the inside of you. He's, he's transforming your mind inside of you, right? And he says, now, we got it covered. I'm your God. You're in covenant. Hmm. Wow. People thrive in secure, committed, loving relationships, and God knows that. Amen? Amen. You're not locked in. Could you walk away from Christ if you chose to? Yes, you could. Don't. Amen. <laughs> but, you know, but in covenant, when you trust and you believe in Jesus and what he's done for you, it's all yours. Amen. You're qualified. <clears throat> That's good. Hebrews 8, 6 to 13. And what I want to show you now real quickly is, uh, is two, at least two places in the New, New Testament where this uh, prophecy of Jeremiah 31 is quoted. It's referred to or quoted. Uh, and there's actually several places. I'll show you these two. So, again, I believe it's Paul who wrote this. And he said, Now Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a, what? <laughs> better covenant, which was established on better promises. So, yeah, it's not the same thing, is it? It's not, it's not the same kind of covenant at all. It's better, better promises. Clearly, we're seeing that. And Jesus made it happen. Go ahead. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. That's plain, clear logic, right? If the, first, if the old covenant uh, under Mosaic law, if it worked and it was good, we wouldn't have changed it. God wouldn't have changed it, right? He said, no, we've got to replace the whole thing. Go ahead. Because finding fault with them, he says, uh, well, pr finding fault with not so much the covenant itself, fault with Israel, right? Fault with it. Couldn't keep it. Neither could we. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah and anybody else who wants in. So he's quoting Jeremiah 31. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. They broke it. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. Born again, I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. We get to know God personally. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Slight change in the wording, but the, uh, you know, the, the idea is the same there. He quotes, quotes that covenant or that promise from Jeremiah 31. Go ahead. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So what, uh, the best way to understand this is that at the time, right, even after Jesus came initially, the temple was still running, right? Jesus came, died for us, rose, went back to heaven. The church is growing. The apostles are preaching. Churches are growing and meeting everywhere. But for quite a few, uh, several decades after that, the temple is still up and running. The priests are still doing daily sacrifices. Right? They're still carrying on as if nothing had changed. Right? The people who didn't receive Jesus, who didn't really believe, they're carrying on the thing. And Paul says, no, it's becoming obsolete and it's ready to vanish away. Jesus famously prophesied, right, that the temple would be destroyed because the leaders of Israel were not receiving him as Messiah. And he said, not one brick shall be left upon another. It's all going to be destroyed. And it happened in 70 AD, right, which is 30-some years after Jesus went back to heaven. Roman army came in and destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, right, dispersed the people. And, and what's my point there? That the old covenant was a package deal, 
right? The temple, the priests, the feast days, everything about it, the Sabbath days, everything about it, along with the commandments and the laws and the rules, it was all a package deal. And people still today kind of want to break it up and say, well, the temple's gone, right? Because the Roman army destroyed it. The temple's gone, but we can still practice the laws and the rules and these other things, right? Well, you don't get to decide that. Nobody gets to decide that. The old covenant was, was an entire package deal. It came together, right? You don't get to pick and choose. You don't, right? So when, the, when, when God allowed the Roman army to come in and destroy that temple and the priesthood and uh, everything, the whole system, you know what God was saying? I'm making it impossible for you to keep the old covenant. I'm making it impossible for you. It's gone. The temple's gone. The priests are gone. The sacrifices are gone. It's done. It's, it's gone. You can't keep it anymore. It's impossible. And you can't pick and choose. Keep parts of it that you think, you know, it's gone. Got a new covenant going on here. And totally new thing. Totally new covenant. The old one vanished away. Go ahead. And every, okay, so now let's move to uh, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 11, and, and he's going to quote uh, at least part again of this, of Jeremiah 31, the prophecy. And so now he's talking about the priesthood, right? Israel had the priesthood and the priests that would minister there at the temple. And he says, every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins, All right? But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. All right, let's jump back to verse 11, please. Did anybody do compare and contrast in fifth grade? Remember that fifth grade, Venn diagrams, compare, contrast, maybe? Okay, yeah, long time ago, I know. So, <laughs> so let's compare and contrast a couple of things here. He said, every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which never take away sin. The temple was still, you know, operating for 30-some years after Jesus came, and the priests there, they stand and they do the same sacrifices over and over and over, sheep and goats and rams and bulls and doves and everything else. And he said, A, it doesn't work. It actually doesn't take away human sin. It's not a, it's not a worthy substitute for the human being. Um, every priest, there's lots of them, and they're standing all the time, day after day after day, repeating this over and over and over. Every time someone sins, they bring a sacrifice. They bring an animal, right? Go ahead. Verse 12, but Jesus, after he had offered how many sacrifices? Yeah, one. One, one, one final sacrifice. It was himself, the perfect, worthy sacrifice for our sins. Uh, then he sat down. <laughs> the contrast, of course, is the other priests were still standing up, doing it over and over and over. Jesus did it once, and he sat down. And he said, no, we're done. Done, done, right? Sat down at the right hand of God. That's awesome. It's finished. The covenant's in place. The covenant is established. You're invited in. Boom. All right. Sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Go ahead. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. And this is a reference to Psalm 110, where King David prophesied, right? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, which was a prophecy about God the Father inviting Jesus at the ascension, right? To say, Jesus, come on up here, sit at my right hand until the day comes when we stomp out evil on earth and you set up your kingdom forever. Amen. Yeah, so Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father because the covenant's in place, the one sacrifice is done, and it says, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. I think this one's a little interesting too. Uh, he says you are perfected forever, and he says you are being sanctified. Okay. Does that sound a little contradictory almost? You're, you're already perfected forever, but you're being sanctified? <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, Perfected forever means that from God's viewpoint, what he did on the cross, right, and he sees the finished work, that if you say yes to Jesus and your yes remains yes, right, he says you're going to be done and finished. I've already provided for it on the cross. It's a, it's a done deal in my mind and my heart, and I see you finished, right? But on the practical daily level, you're still being transformed day by day. You're still being changed, right, and cleaned up, right, day by day. That's what sanctified is. And so... Uh, you know, the question, well, am I already perfected forever or am I being sanctified? Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Both, both. Absolutely. Good. And keep going. 
By the Holy, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. So he's only going to quote this part of it, right? But he says, so this is the covenant. I'm going to put my law in, in your heart, in your mind, a new, a new nature, a new spirit, a new heart, right? And you're going to have this changed. Uh, did he completely solve the problem by doing that? Not entirely, because even how many born again, you still mess up. Right? <laughs> there we go. So he says, I'm going to change your nature, and, it, and it'll be a process, and it'll finish. However, meanwhile, go ahead, verse 17. He adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Otherwise, the covenant would break again. Right? So the co they're, I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to forget, and the covenant goes on because you have remission of sins. In verse 18, now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. So, you know, you mess up today, you, you said the wrong thing, and you know it. You did the wrong thing, and you know it, right? Do you have to bring a sacrifice, offer us? No. He said, it's done, right? It's done. Okay. Therefore, brethren, having, okay, just these last, last uh, couple of, last two or three verses here, I just want to uh, wrap it up with the benefits of this covenant, of knowing the covenant, understanding the covenant, right? Having confidence and trust in this covenant. So he says, therefore, brethren, having, what do we have? Boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. He's talking about entering the very presence of God, right? And the old covenant was the holy of holies, but he means the throne room of heaven, the presence of God as your father. You have boldness to enter his presence, right? That's awesome. That's strong language because even if he had said confidence to enter his presence, that would have been good, right? It would have been good by the blood of Jesus, by covenant, by forgiveness of sins. But if, if he had said confidence, that would be good. But he says boldness. Boldness is like a three-year-old, right, who runs into daddy's arms and jumps into his lap and fully expects to be received and embraced, right? right? There's no fear of rejection, no fear of, right, just run in and, ah, you know. That's what he says. You have boldness to enter the holiest, enter... Father God's presence, boldness. Well, if you understand the covenant, you have boldness, right? Not arrogance, boldness. Big difference. But this boldness translates into some other things too because I find over the years that it translates into bolder living, right? Bolder living because that means I, I'm living fully, right? I can take risks. I'm not living in fear, right? I'm going to try things. I'm going to expect God to be with me, right? Bold living. I'm going to speak to people about Jesus, right? And they can like it or not, but, you know, I'm not going to be, you know. Bold living. It comes, and it didn't, it didn't come easy for me because I didn't grow up with bold living. And I don't know about, you know, some of you. I grew up with some fear and some anxiety and some, you know, insecurities and, you know, some low self-esteem and all kinds of stuff like that. You know, so bold living was not, a, was not an easy thing for me. But over the years, as God's living inside of me, right, and I'm learning his covenant and his truth, I get bolder and bolder. And you find out that when you get bolder, it's better. Life is better, isn't it? Rather than being all intimidated and all afraid and all anxious and all insecure about everything, right, bolder is better. Not arrogant ever, but bolder. Amen? So good. Go ahead. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. All right, two things here that we can see. The second part says our hearts are sprinkled from an evil conscience and we're washed with pure water. So what he's saying here is because of this covenant, if you understand the covenant, you live without shame, you live without guilt, you live without condemnation. Amen? Yeah, you live knowing that you are clean in the presence of God. I didn't do it. He did it. But I like it. Right? So your conscience doesn't stop you now. Your conscience doesn't condemn you. It'll, it may correct you, and we listen to that, okay? Don't get me wrong. But basically, you know, something's in the past, it's in the past. We're not bound by our past. We're not bound, we're not defined by our past or by a failure or by a sin, right? We're not, we're not walking in shame, you know, for years and years. We're not walking in guilt for years and years. We don't have to do that, right? We are clean, and we can live boldly, humbly and boldly at the same time. There's not a contradiction there, 
Amen? <laughs> it's wonderful, beautiful. Right? So we have this freedom, and then he says, we draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, not only trusting God, right, but, but more specifically, I want to I bring this out, is we can, we can trust that his promises are for us. God has wonderful promises, doesn't he, in the, in the Bible, and his best promises are yours because of the covenant, Right? And I know that, again, our, our tradi- you know, t- traditional thinking would be, I don't know if I'm qualified for these promises, you know, because, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, there's probably Rule 17, Subsection D, you know, that I did something wrong and I don't even know about it. You know, and God's going, nope, sorry, you're not qualified. <laughs> Figure it out. You know, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and it's just not true, right? He said, this is the covenant. <laughs> this is the covenant. You're clean. You're forgiven. I'm living inside of you. You're born again. I'm your God. <laughs> you get it. Uh, you get to know me personally. This is the covenant. And so God, he wants you to have the assurance of faith that all of his best promises are for you. He has made you qualified. Amen. He has made you qualified. <clears throat> all right. Shall we pray? Let's stand together and <clears throat> gonna give us some background. Cool. cool. So Holy Spirit, I welcome you. Thank you that you're here teaching us, speaking to our hearts, revealing yourself to us, God, revealing your word, your covenant your heart, your love, revealing your plan and your will, drawing us close, filling us with your presence, God. So right now, God, we open our hearts again. We open our souls to you. Touch us, Jesus. Oh, Father, draw us close. Holy Spirit, come and fill us, fill us more. Maybe just lift your hands, close your eyes. Just between you and God, invite him still. Fill me, God, fill me. I'm yours. I open my heart. Open my soul to you. Fill me, God. Speak to me. Draw me close. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's here. Pray a prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, yes to your covenant. Yes to forgiveness of sins. And you remember them no more. And you are my God. I'm your child. And you put your nature inside of me. Teach me from the inside. Transform me from the inside. And I get to know you personally. This is the covenant. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Just receive that. So let let God just speak to your heart and reveal that to you. Pour that into you.
Thank you, God. You're touching us, blessing us. I want, I want, to, I want to pray uh, a specific prayer. Is there anybody here right now that you have pain in your body today? Raise your hand. In fact, come on up, would you? If you have pain in your body right now, some injury, wound, sickness that's just really, you're feeling it today. you all to hear too, but I'm also going to invite, if uh, if you're comfortable praying for people and you trust God to touch them, really touch them today, just, uh, would you come up and help me pray? I could, I could have uh, eight or ten people come up right here, maybe, maybe a dozen, come on, come up and begin to lay hands on somebody here. If you see somebody standing alone, still come and pray for them. We're going to do this together. I'll lead it all, but come on up and you don't have to be like perfect and you know, you get it, right? You just you're willing to pray, you're comfortable laying hands on somebody and trust God that he'll use you. I can still take a few more. Up front too, if you can come up front and pray for anybody here who's still standing up here. Okay? Still could take one or two more, I think. Have we got it? Okay. Now let's pray together, and you that are, that are praying, say this, in the name of Jesus, I command spirit of sickness, disease, infirmity, pain, and affliction, in Jesus Christ's name, get out now. Holy Spirit, come, pour into my brother, my sister, into the place where they hurt. Bring your healing power through my prayer, through my hands. Flow in now, in Jesus' name. Now just begin to pray for them. Pray in the Spirit. And we'll just take a few moments here. We're not in a hurry. Just begin to pray over them right now in your own words. Pray in the Spirit. That's good. Let God just flow through your hands. Let God's power and healing touch flow through you right now, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Move here. We welcome you healing people from pain, healing injuries and wounds, healing sickness and disease. God, by your stripes, we were healed. By your stripes, Jesus, we are healed. By your stripes, we're being healed right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We welcome your working and your moving right now in Jesus' name, moving into places where people have pain in their joints, their bodies, any organ, any body system, any joint, any muscle, any bone, huh, backs, always a big thing. Holy Spirit, just flow through people's spines right now, flow through their backs, through the muscles, the nerves, bring their backs into alignment, heal them from trauma in Jesus' name. I command trauma to go. Get out. All trauma be, be gone in Jesus' name. Muscles that were affected by injury, wounds, by fear and trauma, be healed right now in Jesus' name. Be made whole right now. Jesus, Jesus, touch people where they hurt. Touch people where their body's not working right. Whew. Thank you, Lord. Recreate tissue, recreate joints, cartilage. Huh, Lord, restore nerves, muscles to shalom, peace, and well-being. Jesus, you are Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Holy Spirit, you are Jehovah Rapha, our healer, flowing now. Thank you, Lord. Just soak your people, right, God? Right now, soak them with your healing touch, your healing power. Yeah, God, I specifically believe you for recreation of damaged tissue or degenerated tissue, cartilage, joints, huh. invertebrae, damaged or degenerated tissue. 
be restored right now in Jesus' name. Be healed, recreated. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are here recreating people in your image, recreating them to function beautifully. You're doing your dunamis works. Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And just thank Him, too, as we're praying. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Lord. We're receiving your touch right now. People that are also watching by uh, live stream, Jesus, touch them right now, Jesus. You can put your hand where you hurt on live stream. Put your hand where you hurt, where you need a healing touch. Jesus will flow through your hand right now. How oh, We agree with you in faith. We invite Jesus to touch you and heal you where you are right now, where you hurt, where you're injured, wounded, or sick. Ha, oh, Holy Spirit, pour into them. Pour into them right now. We give you thanks, God. We give you thanks, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Whew. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Shaha. Whoa. Still, it's still, God's still working, still moving. I can feel it. God, baptize people right now with your spirit. Fill them, God, with your presence. Pour into people right here or watching at home. Pour, Holy Spirit, pour into them. Filling them, filling them with your love and power. Filling them with your presence and anointing. <sighs> that they know your presence, that they know your voice, that they know your power, that they know your love, God. That's good. He's touching you. He's going to continue to touch you right now. Healing sometimes happens in a moment. Oftentimes it begins as we're praying and, and his spirit is continuing to work through you for minutes, hours, the rest of the day, coming weeks sometimes. God's touching you right now. We agree together. We believe we receive it. Thank you, Lord. God bless you, everybody. I love you. Thanks for being here today. Amen.